starting. Attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome to the January the 26th uh, broadcast of the Global Share Portfolio. This is our monthly webinar. We do bring you up to date every month for about half an hour on exactly how the portfolio has performed. Uh, this month, there's uh, some quite interesting changes uh, to the um, share price performance, but the biggest change has been a um, increase in the value of the RAND, which is offset. So we went up very strongly in the US, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, on the shares that we bought, but the RAND has then taken away a lot of that uh, shine. But first of all, in Johannesburg, I'm here in London, it's Alec Hogg, and in Johannesburg, of course, as always, our managing editor. Thanks, Alec. It's Stuart this side. I'm looking forward to taking all your questions. Please just put them on the right-hand dashboard, and I'll get Alec to answer as soon as possible. But yeah, good to be back. Yeah, it, I hope everybody had a, a wonderful festive season and a good break. Um, just looking at the one purchase that we did today, and I need to explain this a little. What we do in this portfolio is to try and eliminate the impact of the exchange rate and share price movements. We stagger our purchases over three months. So you will see that in this period we've bought the last of the Metrobank shares. Metrobank is a UK listed company, that's why it says at £32.35. And if you multiply 157 by £32.35, you won't get to 6298 because that's in US dollars. So we've converted it back into US dollars, a little complicated, but uh, this is a global portfolio. So we do have most of our money invested in the United States, but we also do have two stocks that are uh, in, on the London stock market. Well, there's the portfolio, the overall portfolio in dollars. As you'll see, it's now a 30% gain uh, since we started this portfolio in December 2014. What is interesting is there were some pretty hefty moves in the past month by companies that were enjoying a little bit of the Trump dividend and also a re-rating on the tech side. If you have a look at the first of the stocks there, that's the Vanguard S&P 500 index. We began with 30% of the portfolio invested in Vanguard. As we've found better opportunities, we've sold the index fund and taken that money and reinvested into companies like Tesla uh, and Facebook and Metro Bank. So that's part of the strategy here, is to have the money in an index fund to benefit from the weakness of the RAND. Remember, we did start this portfolio two years ago when the RAND was 11, RAND 27 to the US dollar. It's now 13 Rand 27 to the US dollar. So there's been a lot of bumping in between. As you well know, it got uh, much higher than, uh, or, or much weaker than the current level, but uh, it does get, support our overall thesis, which is let's get money offshore. And the good fortune is that the money that we have taken offshore has substantially outperformed the market as a whole. You'll see their Vanguard, which really tracks the market, was up 12% in the last two years, whereas the portfolio overall in dollars or in hard currency terms, look at that number down the bottom, is up 30%. In this period, just to take you very briefly through the changes in the past month, the big winners were Tesla Motors, which is one of our more speculative stocks, a bit of a wild card. As you see, it's our smallest holding of 4%. We bought that up over three months. Well, that has just come well. It's up 28% in the last month. I hope that uh, you're enjoying seeing the Pretoria-born Elon Musk getting his just rewards now on a fabulous company. 28% gain in the last month. Maybe that's another Amazon for us. Amazon talking about that, you can see it's been our best performer by quite some distance. 155% gain in Amazon share price since we bought it on the 5th of December 2014. It had another very good month. The shares there going from $768 to $836. And uh, Amazon now, um, once again, uh, our second biggest holding, and it only started as an 8% stock, an 8% uh, slug of the portfolio, it's now worth double that amount. Also good in this month was Alphabet, one of our core stocks there. That was up from just under $800 to $835 a share. Apple, at last, is getting back to the um, break-even level. We have really had to nurse this uh, holding over a period of time, but I still think it's one of the cheapest stocks in the US uh, market. It has a PE of 12, or actually under 12, a price to earnings ratio, um, the, and plenty of money, billions of dollars in the bank. Another good thing for Apple, which I think that the market is finally starting to understand, is the decision by the new president 
to bring back or allow American companies to bring back offshore earnings without penalizing them with a taxation uh, levy is going to be very, very beneficial for Apple because most of the 200 billion in cash that it has offshore, uh, or rather that it does hold on its balance sheet, is outside of the country. So it would be a big beneficiary bringing that money back. IBM had another particularly good month. In fact, it helped um, the Dow uh, to get above 20,000 for the very first time. The Dow, which is a index of 30 stocks that's been going for over 100 years, uh, is a, a barometer for the health of the oldest uh, companies on Wall Street, although both Apple and IBM are in that index. There is a, uh, of the last 1,000 points that the Dow has put on, in other words, to get it to 20,000. So of the last 1,000 points, IBM has contributed 106 points. So 10% of that final move through the, uh, the benchmark area. Also in this past month, we had a lovely move in Facebook. Looks like we might have timed our purchase really well there. They went from $120 to $131. You will recall, those of you who have been following this, the, these um, webcasts over the last two years, I've been eyeing Facebook for quite some time, wanting to uh, make the plunge. Finally did so on the 25th of October. Um, and we then, over the three month periods, October, November, December, did our purchases. And in this month, it's uh, obliged by moving up to over $130 a share. And then, of course, the star performer this month was Tesla, which went from $198 uh, last month to $254 at its current share price. That's the overall portfolio showing a 30% gain. Uh, it um, is witness to a little bit of good luck that we've had there in making. Uh, some pretty nice um, uh, share selections and also the market overall has assisted. Of course, aimed primarily at South African investors, uh, you have to look at the portfolio in rands. That's the most important um, the determinant if you're sitting in South Africa and investing through the web trader platform. Incidentally, you can put a million rand into the web trader platform, no questions asked from exchange control. So you can replicate this portfolio immediately and uh, with the rand having risen so sharply. If you have a look down towards the bottom, we're at 13.27 against the US dollar. A month ago, it was at 14.23. So a very big move in the rand. It's picked up a rand in the last month. I think this is largely due to the belief in the global markets anyway that Jacob Zuma is not going to go and blow his uh, foot off by making changes to the cabinet. If this was highly rumored in uh, early December. The uh, view was that he would bring his ex-wife from Kosozana Zuma into the cabinet and fire uh, the highly respected Pravin Gordon. With that news coming into the open, also a very strong showing by the Zuma free delegation in Davos, uh, there has been more confidence that has come into the, um, into the South African political uh, arena. One more thing, of course, is that Jacob Zuma literally has 10 more months left. That's it, because in January, uh, in December, rather, the ANC has its presidential elective conference, and if a president like, uh, or if Ramaphosa or Zuele Mkhizi, who are two of the three nominees, Zuma's ex-wife being the third one, if one of those two were to come into, into power, then Zuma may well serve out his term, but he would be unable to do anything uh, disruptive because the new president of the ANC would simply recall him at that stage, as Zuma did you will recall, uh, to his predecessor, Thabo Mbeki. So generally in the international markets, there's a feeling that there won't be any shocks coming from South Africa. We don't know, though, with the enigmatic uh, president that is in that country. And as a consequence of that, of the international reading, the RAND has been firm. Of course, South African interest rates also appealing at the moment relative to those in other emerging markets. And all, uh, as much as you might criticize the South African geopolitical situation, it compares extremely well with other emerging markets right now, like Russia, uh, Turkey, Brazil, and uh, others of that ilk. So the rand is affirmed, 1327 to the US dollar, 1673 against the pound. That's also up by one uh, rand against the pound in the last month. And that is offset that wonderful improvement we saw in the value of our stocks. But that is the determinant that one has in uh, when you're playing in uh, international currencies. What you need to do is, first of all, make a long-term bet, and our long-term bet is that the RAND will be weak. Secondly, try and find good in, uh, stocks to invest in, in uh, hard currencies, and uh, we've been successful in that regard so far. Remember, you can ask questions. Um, Stuart will pick them up, and Stu, you just uh, interrupt me when you need to.
Yes, thanks, Alec. I've got a question slash statement from Francois Ghost. He says, value investing does not seem to consider major structural changes in the market. However, in the short to medium term, these do seem to have a significant impact on share price. Does Buffett have anything to say about this other than to stagger one's investment over time? Buy when others are afraid, avoid when others are greedy. Yes, uh, Buffett would uh, do that uh, purchasing when others are afraid um, and, and selling or rather being a little more cautious when others are greedy uh, as a general term. But what he does is extreme bottom-up investing. He would have a look at a uh, at a company, work out its intrinsic value, and that you do by taking a period in time. With international stocks, we take a 10-year, um, at Business News, we would take a 10-year view, and then we would look at the cash that will be generated over 10 years. We then add that to the uh, current uh, value of that company and have a look at what the company would be worth. That would give you an idea of what the company would be worth in 10 years' time and that would be our intrinsic value. We would then only buy the stock if it were trading at a discount of between 20 and 30 percent to the intrinsic value. That's as a general principle. That's value investing. In the South African context, we look at the shares over only five years. So we, we uh, calculate the, uh, the, the cash flow over five years because South Africa is a far riskier um, geography than is the United States. But you have the exponentiality of some companies, and while we would be looking very much at, the, at that basis when considering stocks like IBM and Apple, when we look at Tesla or Amazon.com or even Google, which is now called Alphabet, we bring in other uh, determinants, and we would then accelerate the growth rate because we do believe that those companies would uh, grow much faster, and by the same token, we also extend the term, the life term, if you like, beyond 10 years. And that is what gives us a, uh, a more comfortable feeling when going into exponential shares. It's, it's something very difficult that human beings battle with to get their heads around. What is exponentiality? If you can imagine, if you'd taken a value investor decision on NASPERS any time in the last five years, you would have lost out on the greatest run in any stock listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to the degree that NASPERS has come from just about nothing in the index to 20% now of the JSE All Share Index. It's quite an extraordinary success story. So you need to embrace what exponentiality is. You need to understand the company. And then if you think the company is a, a wonderful bet into the future, that it's going to grow in excess of, of others, or that it's got a, 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 a business model that is going to shoot the lights out like Amazon.com, our view on that one, as well as uh, as Alphabet, um, as well as Tesla, indeed, um, and also Metrobank, which is uh, the UK's version of uh, Capitec, and, uh, and you may as well add Facebook to that one, too. So we're looking at those as being exponential growth opportunities, and uh, you can't really work on the value investing thought that way around. Investing is something that you understand when you, when you, it must be bottom up, and that's what Buffett teaches us, buy the company, not the share, and understand the company and have a very good feeling for what you think the company is worth, and then buy it when you have a, uh, an opportunity to buy or acquire the shares below the price that you value them at. That's really what it's about. And then be patient. Most of these shares, if you've been with us in the last two years, you will know that even Amazon and, and Alphabet, and especially Berkshire and IBM and Barclays, have actually reversed quite badly before they've come back and, and contributed to our um, portfolio's uh, value or gains over this period. So find the right stock, buy it cheap or what you think is cheap, and then be patient. Just hold on. Don't trade. Those are really the secrets uh, that Warren Buffett teaches us. If you have a look here, the individual stock performances, it shows you in RANDs, uh, Amazon has been uh, comfortably our, our best bet. Uh, Alphabet at 84% is also a big winner. That was one of our core holdings right from the outset. Um, and uh, Vanguard and Berkshire, uh, Vanguard is the market overall. Berkshire uh, in line with the market. Tesla, we've only had it for four months, three or four months, and that's already uh, done a, a fantastic return. And IBM is now getting up there as well. Apple, the disappointment. Facebook, we've only had it uh, for a short period of time, so we don't need to worry too much about that. And Metro Bank is one of those long-term holdings. It's the, uh, the future capital, we really believe.
and there's a, a graphical representation. As you can see, the Rand dollar exchange rate, um, we've outperformed that on, well, more than half the portfolio now. Stuart? So, Alec, it's a question from Andrew. He says he's read that Buffett apparently uses derivatives to hedge Berkshire. I'm not sure how valid that is, but he wants to know if that's something you can talk about. He doesn't use derivatives to hedge Berkshire Hathaway itself, but he does use derivatives within his uh, reinsurance portfolio. And within, uh, remember, Berkshire is, is almost three companies in one. It has a huge insurance operation. In fact, in the last few days, they have just done another transaction on that um, with uh, AIG. You might remember AIG was one of the um, star performers in the global financial crisis, and I mean that in the in a little little bit of sarcasm there. Um, but AIG has recovered from the global financial crisis. It's one of the biggest insurance companies in the world, and it's done a deal with Berkshire, where Berkshire has taken has got an extra ten billion dollars. In, into its float. In other words, $10 billion that it can use to pay out exposures that AIG have got of about $34 billion. Now, not all of the $34 billion is going to have to be paid out. There's no way Warren Buffett's going to buy $34 billion uh, in liabilities and only get $10 billion for it. So a proportion of that, that will be paid out. But until it is, until it is um, uh, paid to uh, or the liabilities are met, uh, Berkshire has got that $10 billion that it can invest. And that's really how Buffett started. He had an insurance uh, company, he built the insurance company, used the money in the insurance company, just to, to really simplify it. If you pay for your car insurance today, it's on the expectation that if you have an accident sometime in future, then the, the insurer will actually pay you out for that accident. Now, insurers tend to make a profit on that uh, contract that they have with us. But before you have your accident, and please God it doesn't happen, but I, just for, for illustrative purposes, I think you get this. Before you have that, the insurance company can use your money in any way it wants to, and that is called the float. And that is what Warren Buffett has done in Berkshire Hathaway. So he's got a massive float that he can invest and earn returns on until such time as that money will be repaid to the people whose premiums are being given to him for some kind of insurance cover. So that's one part of the business, very big insurance business. A second part of the business is more than 80 subsidiaries that are owned, wholly owned subsidiaries. In fact, nine and a half of those companies would be Fortune 500 companies on their own. Um, we're talking here about BNSF, which is the uh, biggest railroad business in the United States. Berkshire Hathaway's um, electrical company, which is bigger, for instance, than Eskom, and companies of that ilk, very large subsidiaries that they have as wholly owned subsidiaries in the portfolio. And then thirdly, there's a portfolio of over $100 billion in investments, and those investments are allocated about two-thirds of them in five individual stocks. And depending on how those three parts work, that is how Berkshire will perform in a year. So it's not a but Berkshire is really three companies in one, and those three companies, or those three legs, if you like, if they're all firing as they all seem to be doing at the moment, then the share price will benefit from it. You can see on the on the screen now is the dividend receipts that we've received in um, well in the last two years. In this last month, we added uh, $146, which came from the Vanguard S&P. They pay dividends every four months. We should be looking forward to quite a juicy dividend from. Uh, both IBM and Apple in the near future, um, both of those paying out um, dividends in February. So a little more dividend flow coming through on that. I hope that answers the question overall there with Warren Buffett. Vanguard S&P 500 index, this is a uh, was a core holding right to, be, uh, to begin with. It's an index investment. It's a good way to start if you are investing in a market that you're learning about. Um, it, as you can see, it's done pretty well in the last year. And what I do like here is on the day of uh, Donald Trump's election, and you can you, you can see where uh, that would roughly be on the 8th of November, uh, the US stock market has put on 9%. So it's bumped around for most of the uh, previous nine months. But uh, since November, the election of Donald Trump, uh, the S&P 500 index gaining 9%, of course, that helped our portfolio. The second company or the major company 
be the uh, biggest stake that we have now. Almost a fifth of the portfolio is in Alphabet or the old Google. That's a picture of Sergi Brin and Larry Page. Sergi, who's on the left, was in fact at Davos this year and uh, quite a star attraction, as you can imagine. This is a picture of a few years before. He's now got a little book barky and um, it's kind of graying, almost like uh, Larry Page is, but uh, lost none of his mental power. Well, the share price of Alphabet has had a really good run in the last couple of weeks, and as you can see there, a lovely uptick um, for that stock. What's, we're going we're gonna to hear much more about Alphabet today after the market closes in the United States. So watch out for those results. We'll have something on the site on biznews.com, of course, tomorrow. The analysts are anticipating that the earnings for the fourth quarter of the year will come out at about $9.60 as against $8.60 a year ago. And Ruth Porat, the financial director of Alphabet, is getting a lot of um, uh, kudos around this. If the numbers come out better than anticipated, you can see that sharp spike of the last few days uh, extended. However, if um, they disappoint for whatever reason, uh, then there will be a bit of a pullback. But uh, you can pick up on what happens uh, or what happened in the fourth quarter uh, a little later this afternoon if you're really that keen. Um, um, Alphabet continues to make uh, acquisitions, uh, bolt-on acquisitions. They're always the bet, best. And it was interesting to see that it's had a good look at, at Twitter and it pulled out a part of Twitter that works with app developers called Fabric and it bought that little business and put that into uh, Alphabet in this past uh, past few weeks. The other story, uh, as far as Twitter is concerned, Twitter is not part of our portfolio, but they are starting to get their act together. They've closed Vine and they've also reduced their staff complement by 9%. So we'll be starting to look at Twitter a little more closely as an investment proposition uh, over the next month or so. Here's our story. Just, just hmm. on Alphabet, Des wants to know, do you still consider it cheap? Des on us. Uh, Tess, thanks for that question. Um, I do believe that Alphabet has got a good long-term um, business, and when you consider, when you when you have a look at companies uh, that that these exponential companies, that um, uh, when when you try and unpack a relative value for them, just to give you an example, they're looking at fourth quarter revenues up by uh, 15 to 16 percent on a year before. Uh, earnings, a similar growth. If you put that into your spreadsheet and you go 10 years, in the case of Alphabet, 15 years quite comfortably ahead, given that Google is the dominant search engine um, in in the world, and, and that brings all kinds of other opportunities, then these are the kind of businesses, the exponential businesses, that you mustn't pay too much attention on the uh, on your intrinsic value, as long as it's not way out. Um, a way out from where the share price is, but then just buy the shares if you like the, the story and you like the company and you can see the opportunities in the long term and get yourself a slice of the business. Would I be investing 20% of the portfolio in Alphabet right now if we started from a, um, a zero level? I'm not sure. I think some of the other stocks offer better potential uh, or better upside or better value right now. But would I have Alphabet in the portfolio as a weighty holding? Absolutely. It's It's got the perfect business model, and it's one of those that you might get a better performance out of something else, but in 10 years' time, we'll be sitting here. I'm uh, pretty confident that Alphabet will still be a good performer um, on the stock market generally. So it's difficult to, to start uh, telling you whether it's cheap or expensive, but I guess around about fair value right now, um, I would be very happy to to continue accumulating the stock. Amazon is one that I would be happy to cum accumulate or have been happy for us had we uh, wanted to accumulate over this period. And it is now at over $800 a share. It was under $400 a share when we bought it. And I certainly wouldn't be thinking of selling these shares anytime soon. Amazon's results are out on the 2nd of February. You might want to uh, tune in. They've got a webcast that will be available to anybody. So make a note of that. It's 2.30 US time. So South African time is, uh, well, it's into the evening. Um, but it will be a worthwhile exercise. They always are, these results presentations. What I liked about Amazon in the last month was that they've moved now into the banking arena. And this is the world we're in. You, you have to understand that the world is being disrupted 
dramatically in every single area you want to consider. In fact, Amazon's even gone into car parts, would you believe, by doing deals with uh, four of the big motor distributors, car part distributors in the US. It's going to be moving into that field too. But what it did in the past month was very interesting. It is it has a, a an, an offering called Amazon Prime. You pay ninety nine dollars a year for it. You get free delivery. You get free music, uh, free movies. Not the whole uh, the whole offering, but but certain selected part of it. I'm a member of Amazon Prime, but living in the UK, it's it's kind of an obvious thing to do. Um, the benefits that you get from Amazon Prime easily outweigh the ninety nine dollars that you pay for it. But from Amazon's perspective, they're building up these millions and millions of people now who are a captive market. And what they've decided to do is to offer Amazon Prime members a credit card, a Visa credit card, so that every time you buy something on Amazon Prime, you immediately get a 5% discount, a 5% kickback. But not only that, if you go and use it in a restaurant or to buy fuel, you get 2% kickback, and anything else you get 1%. So there's a big incentive now for Amazon Prime members like myself to become even more involved with Amazon. And that's what's happening. Why would I need a card from a bank in future if I've got an Amazon credit card? And who knows where that might all go to. So when you look at Amazon and Google and Facebook, these are companies that are disrupting the world in ways that we don't even imagine yet. But they are the growing companies, they are the businesses that are expanding and the traditional businesses whose markets that they are now creeping into are almost, um, well, I wouldn't say they're dead ducks, but they certainly are going to have to come up with a alternative to it and as we've seen in the media industry from big media companies, it's very difficult when you are uh, trying to compete with a company like Amazon that's got the massive cash flows and the huge audiences. Um, in the same category you could put uh, Google and Facebook. These are companies all in a, in a South African sense, Naspers, which owns over 30% of Tencent, which is the uh, equivalent uh, company in China. These are companies that are just going to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and we can't see how their business model is going to falter. So it's the kind of company you just got to get into, buy your shares, be patient, you'll see reverses from time to time, but over the long term you will be happy. Berkshire Hathaway is at the other end of the spectrum. If you have a look at that, it's uh, it, it's had the Trump dividend in in a in an enormous way because Donald Trump is promising to help uh, traditional America or or establishment America business. As you can see, the share price has gone from around $140 a share. Berkshire's now at 165. It's a big company. It's one of the top five companies in the world. It hasn't done anything uh, spectacular outside of that transaction with AIG, uh, but Berkshire is being is an appealing business for uh, as a as a cornerstone holding, and we're very happy to have that one as well. Also, you you can be quite assured that uh, Warren Buffett isn't going to be making any stupid mistakes. Apple, this is still one of my favourite shares, and I'm so glad to see that the share price has been improving. Uh, since even since the Donald Trump uh, election, the share price is now back above $120. Uh, we bought uh, at a bit higher than this when you take costs etc into account, but we're nearly there now with Apple. And uh, as you can see, it's another example of patience. Going back to May last year, the stock was at $90. We'd actually taken almost a 30% hiding on our Apple shareholding by buying uh, a little bit too early and not staggering our purchases. This was another one that reaffirmed that it's best to stagger your purchases over a period of three months. This one, I liked it so much, I've, I've been watching it for so long. We added uh, all the stock to the portfolio, well, over two tranches, and it would have been much more sensible to do it in staggering it over three months. You just never know what the shares are going to do. But it now looks like Apple is moving in the right direction. Um, this is a company that's trading on a price to earnings multiple of under 12. Um, it's If you have a look at the Dow average, let alone the tech stock average, the Dow average is 15 times and a, a company that's doing all kinds of interesting things uh, including suing Qualcomm, its chip maker, in China of all places. So when you're a big company like that, interesting things do happen but uh, just to repeat very briefly, a huge beneficiary will Apple be 
of the proposal by the new President of the United States to allow American companies to bring their cash from uh, offshore back into the country without any penalty. Stuart? Okay, let's get on to IBM. Uh, here you can see the um, uh, share price uh, at the time that we took this, uh, this picture was 152. Well, it's 168 today, and uh, there's the share price movement or the graph movement. Uh, it's it's continues to run, getting close to. Uh, I apologise. It's 178 today. Warren Buffett was showing a huge loss on his IBM purchases. It was in the billions of dollars. He's now in front, and I, I remember uh, mentioning on this webcast over many months, uh, and you can go back there to when it was under $120 a, a, a share, and we owned the shares at that stage, uh, mentioning that if Warren Buffett's prepared to pay $170 for these shares, surely we should be too, and uh, now we can see the result of that. IBM is a company that has released its quarterly results. It's brought, the, brought out the fourth quarter results on the 18th of January. Once again, it uh, reaffirmed that the strategy that it's doing, just to put this into, into, uh, into a nutshell for you, IBM is a company that used to move boxes. It used to uh, have essentially hardware. It was a hardware company with a little bit of services to it. But it has relationships with all of the Fortune 100 companies and most of the Fortune 500 companies. So its salesmen are arriving at the doorsteps of the biggest companies in the world. What it decided a few years ago was that moving boxes was not a business that was sustainable. It needed to do something different. It needed to get into the new age. So it started something called its strategic initiatives. And in the financial year um, that has just ended, it's, it's 12 months to the end of December, these strategic initiatives produced 32 billion dollars in revenue, which is very very substantial, and that revenue is growing at 13 percent. The biggest, or the star performer there, is its cloud computing revenue, which was up 61 percent. The other areas here, mobile, uh, up 34 percent, security 13, and analytics uh, up by 9 percent. IBM sitting on 8.5 billion dollars in cash, so it can continue to pay its dividends. Its new initiatives are now um, approaching about th one third of the total revenue, and they are growing rapidly while the old initiatives are coming under pressure. So IBM is a, a stock that we bought as a value proposition. It's still, uh, in fact, uh, the good news is that it managed in the fourth quarter to uh, reverse the earnings slide and it pushed earnings up by three and a half percent. Wall Street hasn't liked it because the revenues have been falling, but IBM telegraphed this a long time ago. Um, and the revenues in the past quarter were down very slightly. Moving on to our, the first of our British stocks, and here was one that again emphasizes the uh, need to be patient. We bought this share in April. Uh, as you can see, it was doing okay until Brexit. That's where there's that sharp decline that was on the 23rd of June. After Brexit, the share price was uh, underwater for us for, for, for two reasons. One, the, the shares were down, and secondly, the pound was down. So we were looking pretty sick at one point on the investment into Barclays. Why did we buy it? Because the company is has got an excellent franchise, a high street franchise, uh, and also it was a it is a turnaround situation. And it appears as though more people are buying that argument or that story as well. Coming down from around about 120p, it's now over 220p. So it's had a very good run. Uh, particularly if you're a pound investor. Uh, one of those uh, stocks that uh, has got a South African interest as well through selling its stake in Barclays Africa. Facebook has been a, a marvel for us. We, we watched it for most of the last two years, didn't do a whole lot, uh, then bought the company over a three-month staggered purchase period. And as you can see, it didn't do anything after Trump's election, uh, again on the view that Trump wasn't going to be that good for the technology shares, but all of a sudden that's turned around. People have re reassessed their numbers and had a look again at the opportunities that a, a stock like Facebook offers, and also there's been a, a rapprochement between uh, Donald Trump and the Silicon Valley um, heroes, including Mark Zuckerberg, who did visit with Donald Trump 
at a recent meeting, and it appears now as though things are getting a little bit more on track as far as that relationship is concerned. Remember, uh, California and Silicon Valley was very strongly anti-Trump and very pro Hillary Clinton, but uh, it appears as though Trump doesn't hold those kind of grudges anyway. And the share price, since uh, we concluded our purchases, has put on $10. So you can't hope that that will always happen, um, but the reality is that we've, uh, we're in front now with Facebook, and that's a great place to be, given that this is a wonderful company uh, going into the future. It's, uh, we'll be talking about the Facebook results in due course, um, but it is one of those rapidly expanding exponential businesses that you just kind of have in your portfolio. We were fortunate that we bought it at the time we did. And here's an even more fortunate purchase. Uh, you know, how lucky can you get? We, we finished our purchases of, of Tesla in the three-month period um, as just before it started moving, and uh, that was in November. And this share has now uh, risen 28% in the past month. Elon Musk, a Pretoria-born boy who emigrated to uh, North America when he was 17 years old, is in the process of transforming three industries. What we really liked about Tesla when we were buying it between September, October and November was that it was going through a merger with a much smaller solar city, also uh, within the, the, the Musk family um, owned and, well, Musk uh, financed it, but it, was run, it is run by the Reeve brothers, his cousins, and at that stage there was all kinds of stuff coming out of Wall Street saying that they thought the deal was wrong and the governance was wrong and it, it just looked like a great opportunity for us to acquire uh, or to finally buy into the stock, which we then duly did. Uh, I hope you followed us over that period. What happened in the last month and that a steep incline from around $170 or $180 a share to over $250 in the share price is uh, twofold. First of all, Morgan Stanley, the big Wall Street firm, has upgraded its target on this share to, to $305. And uh, Elon Musk has met twice with Donald Trump. Uh, and it appears as though they've got quite a lot uh, on the business front that they agree with. So that can't be bad for Tesla. Also on top of this, Tesla hired uh, one of Apple's top, uh, top team, a guy called Chris Latner, to run the autonomous driving software unit. What that means is the driverless cars that Tesla are going to be bringing out. Tesla launches its Model 3 in the fourth quarter of this year, and that's going to bring this um, prestigious brand into the uh, ambit of people, well, more normal people, if you like. They, uh, uh, it's, it's going to be more keenly priced than the brands that it has at the moment, and they're looking to produce 183,000 of these vehicles uh, from around 50,000 a year at the moment, 183,000 of these vehicles by 2018. So ramping up the production, uh, Tesla is going to participate in the swing towards electric vehicles. By 2030, it's anticipated that around the world, electric vehicles will make one quarter of all cars sold because of um, the penalties on carbon taxes, etc. And you've got a South African in Elon Musk running the company. How could we stay away? I'm delighted that we didn't for too long anyway. And then finally, Metrobank. Metrobank is the uh, UK's version of Capitec. Uh, I was recommended to have a look at it in the first place by Ferry Fari, the chief executive of Capitec. And what I've seen there, I really, really like. The share price hasn't done a whole lot since we bought in. It's been bumping along there. But that's uh, kind of standard to practice for this portfolio. You buy the shares, you put them away, you hold on to them, and you wait a little while um, and until uh, the, the opportunities or the realization of, of, of the value starts coming out. This is a company that really is, if you look at the, the high street banks in the UK, it is like a Capitec against the high street banks in South Africa. It has a, a wonderful um, a franchise. It's growing rapidly, opening new branches. And it, is, it was started by an American who did the same thing in the United States, starting from scratch with a different, a Capitec type, type approach to banking. And eventually he sold the bank that he built there for billions of dollars. Um, that is a, a repeat opportunity that is, is likely to happen here. Those of you who are considering replicating this portfolio and are worried that maybe 29% uh, annualized growth in the last two years uh, is means that a lot of the heat's gone out of it. I wouldn't worry too much about that. The RAND at the moment is very firm by historical standards. 
it has improved considerably. I would suggest that it's a good time right now at 1327 to the dollar and 1673 to the pound to be doing your purchases of offshore companies. Uh, the South Africa remains a very volatile uh, geopolitical environment and a move one way or the other can really shake this currency. It's now offering pretty good value for South African residents who are looking to globalize their portfolio. So if it is, it has been on your, uh, on your mind. Uh, we've had uh, a 6% gain in the Rand in the past month. Uh, those kind of gains usually are followed by retracements. So, and of course, there, there could be, if we had a Nenegate 2, which uh, hopefully doesn't happen, but it's always possible, um, that could see a significant uh, uh, reversal in the Rand's good fortunes of the moment. Stuart, any more questions from your side? Yes, Alex, sorry, a bit of audio issues. The Owen wants to know, with regards to resource stocks, why there aren't any in the portfolio, given the big turnaround in Glencore Rio and BHP last year? Yeah, that was one that we missed. But we always high bias towards tech stocks. Yeah, we're always going to miss resource stocks. Um, and I, I go with Buffett's view on, on this one. His, his feeling is that when you're going to invest in shares, you are investing in human potential. You are investing in um, the ability of the company, which is run by human beings, to leverage the, the, the uh, human initiative or the initiative of human beings to add value for you. When you invest in a resources share, you're buying an inanimate object. And an inanimate object is there's no leverage. You can you can trade it, you can play with it, you can get clever, you can buy Anglo American a year ago and put on 150 percent in a year because commodity prices have risen, because Anglo has restructured its business, etc. But that could also go down by 50 percent in the next year. That's not to me. That's not investing. Investing is when you acquire an interest in a company that you can hold indefinitely. If you buy into Anglo today, for instance, or had you bought into it a year ago, you'd have a very comfortable um, uh, situation that you're looking in. But what happens if the trade war gets out of control and commodity prices fall again? These are things you can't read. Uh, it, to buy an inanimate object is not investing, it is trading. Uh, that's my view on, on this thing, and it, it is one that uh, I agree with Warren Buffett on. When you try and predict the future, the chances are you're going to get it wrong. And if you don't believe me on that, go and read Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Taleb. And uh, once you read that book, you'll realize that uh, the guys who are crowing about the, the money they've made on Anglo in the last year are the same people who are going to be very quiet about the losses that they might have made somewhere else in that period as well. I don't believe that commodities and resources stocks are investments. I believe they're traders, and we are investing. Thanks, Alex. This might be more of a statement. Uh, it says, why on earth would the U.S. government penalize their own companies for bringing money back into the country? I'm sure that's pre-Trump days. That's what it's for. It is, and, and, and I would agree with you absolutely. It is a, it is a ridiculous situation, it seems. Uh, it might have something to do with the taxes. It might have something to do with uh, a liberal um, strategy towards helping other countries around the world. If you make money there, leave the money there. I really don't know what the motivation would have been, but it seems a very, very strange motivation, particularly if the United States uh, needs more capital. It's got lots of debt. Uh, it, it needs its own companies to be investing within the, com the country. It's probably something historic that, that exists there, but uh, I don't agree with everything. In fact, there's a lot I don't agree with what Trump is doing. But on this one, I would certainly think that uh, he's just being pretty sensible. If you've got, if you had South African companies, multinationals, um, like a Bidvest or a um, or an Old Mutual or an Investec, why would you penalise them if they wanted to bring the, the the cash back home to invest in the domestic economy? Doesn't seem to make sense. Anyway, Trump is fixing that. Thanks, Alec. A final question from Andrew. He just wants to know. He says, if I had 1.5 million, do I move it offshore or do I go through Web Trader? 
If you have uh, 1.5 million, my suggestion to you would be to take the first 1 million and put that into WebTrader. You, there's no questions asked when it comes to the, the, that million rand. You're allowed to do that. The other 500,000 rand, you're going to have to apply for exchange control approval if you want to take it offshore, or in fact, even if you want to put it into into Web Trader. So the first million rand exchange control, there's no questions asked. There's no no forms to fill in. It's it's uh, it's all part of your annual allowance. What I would do in a case like that is probably put the first million rand into this portfolio. Um, and keep the other half a million, and next year you can put the other, you can put another million rand if you have it, uh, into the portfolio as well. That million rand is per annum, so there is a uh, a big advantage. Exchange control is quieting down a little bit in South Africa, but that would be my recommendation for you in this case. You, you really have got through Web Trader a fantastic opportunity. You live in South Africa, you 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 make your money in South Africa, but you, it doesn't mean you have to have all your money tied up in the uh, fortunes of the South African economy by investing in Web Trader, as we have recommended uh, in this portfolio in the last two years, you can in fact invest offshore and and have the the your asset prices uh, quoted in in international uh, in hard currency terms, and you can see when the rand weakens what a boon that can be. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's been a real uh, privilege and a pleasure again to take you through the portfolio. It's an interesting ride that we see in the international stock markets and the purpose of this portfolio really is to give you something to work with, to work towards. Replicate the portfolio if you can. Um, you will then at least have a monthly update from me on the, um, on the performance of the shares. So it's not like you're making an investment and closing your eyes and forgetting about it. In the term of the portfolio, we have sold one share, Novo Nordisk, a um, diabetes maker, it really got into quite big problems that nobody anticipated. It was, uh, j just to put it into context, the chief executive of Novo Nordisk was uh, rated as the best CEO in the world by Harvard Business School. And then uh, out of the blue, he got fired. Uh, we didn't really know why. Fortunately, we got out of the share at that stage. Then came a massive profit warning, and uh, there's all kinds of um, skeletons coming out of that particular cupboard. Well, unfortunately, you can't get them all right, but when a, uh, you have a dramatic change in the fortunes of a company, that is the time that we will be selling. But we try to buy into companies that we believe we can hold forever. Another reason why we steer clear of resources and commodity stocks. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back with you in uh, right about the same time next month. We'll give you lots of advance warning. And, uh, well, happy investing in 2017. Cheers, Stuart. Thanks, Alex. Cheers, eh?